noon Eastern on Book TV. World-renowned inventor of computer-based musical instruments and author of several books on artificial intelligence, including The Age of Intelligent Machines, The Singularity is Near, and his bestseller, The Age of Spiritual Machines. Join our live three-hour discussion as Book TV's In-Depth welcomes Ray Kurzweil this Sunday at noon Eastern on C-SPAN 2. This is the 11th annual Texas Book Festival. Laura Bush, the uh, First Lady, was the First Lady of Texas when she started this, and now she is the Honorary Chairman. The uh, Book TV bus is in Austin for this festival, and we're in the Book TV bus with Matthew Continetti. He is the author of this book, uh, The K Street Gang, The Rise and Fall of the Republican Machine. You are in the home state of one of the major players of your book, Tom DeLay. Absolutely. What is his role in this book? Tom DeLay, the machine politician who came to Congress as part of the Texas Six Pack in 1984 and then uh, did so much to create the K Street Project, which was the shifting of the lobbyist community's alliance from the Democratic Party to the Republican Party after the Republican Revolution in 1994. You have some other people, it's pictures on the front of your book that are also uh, a part of that. Who are they? Well, there's, of course, Jack Abramoff at the center of a wide-ranging uh, lobbying and corruption scandal. Abramoff, of course, pleaded guilty earlier this year to bribing public officials. Also on the cover is Ralph Reed, the former executive director of the Christian Coalition, who, because of his ties to Abramoff, recently lost a primary for lieutenant governor in Georgia last July. And the final member of the uh, gang on the cover is Grover Norquist, the anti-tax activist, a longtime ally of Abramoff and Norquist, uh, Abramoff and Reed's, mm -hmm. whose group, the Americans for Tax Reform, was used as a pass-through, uh, pass a kind of shell for which uh, Abramoff could funnel money. Uh, from his Indio Casino clients to Ralph Reed's consulting business. Is this an anti-Republican book? I wouldn't say so. Uh, I'm a conservative. It's written from a conservative's perspective. It's written more in sorrow than in anger. It's a book about how idealists came to power and then found themselves corrupted by it, uh, found themselves coming to Washington to do good and then staying there to do well. So I wouldn't say it's an anti-Republican book. It certainly attacks certain members of the Republican Party, and that's because I think it's important for conservatives to recognize that we do have some bad actors in the movement. What uh, was your own story in getting to this book? Sure. Well, I came to Washington relatively recently uh, from a school in New York City and then worked at the Weekly Standard. And when the Abramoff scandal broke, uh, we, we thought at the Weekly Standard that this was definitely important not only to cover as a story in itself, because the tale of corruption is so uh, interesting. It's almost novelistic. It, sometimes it reads like parody. But also as conservatives, it was important to recognize this, to say that we are able to confront the bad facts and move beyond them. And so that's how we came to, I came to write The K Street Gang. What's going to happen if that doesn't happen? What's going to happen to the party? Oh, absolutely. Well, we look at a situation now heading into the midterm election where I think all too many parts of the party, certainly in the House, and the Republican majority in the House, have not been able to confront these facts. And Tom DeLay resigned from Congress, resigned from his position as majority leader. But then the person who replaced him, uh, Blunt, uh, or who was in a race to replace him, and then Boehner actually replaced him from Ohio. Boehner, of course, before he became majority leader, is famous for actually taking checks from tobacco lobbies here at the, on the House floor. So all of these people in the leadership have ties, I think, too close ties to the business community and the lobbying community. Uh, and I was actually thinking longer term. Oh, sure. What are we talking about uh, for the presidential election, but even further out than that? Uh, what do Republicans need to do to get their uh, hands around the problem that you outline in the book? Well, some of the work's already been done for them. You know, it's always kind of heartening for me to find out that actually uh, most of the members of the K Street gang have either been arrested, or they're on their way to jail, or they've been forced out of politics entirely. The gang has basically been broken up. And so I think that's a reassuring sign. But longer term, I think we're going to find that the conservative movement is going to look inward, certainly after the 2006 election and into the 2008 presidential election. It's, not, it's going to be less concerned, I think, about expanding uh, its uh, majorities. Uh, of course, the majorities are in danger, but also more concerned about uh, revitalizing its ideas. Because I think we've seen, and I think stories like this show, that conservatism is, it's a tired movement. It's, uh, it, its powers uh, are waning. And I think it's time that uh, the conservatives are going to go look back and see how to re revitalize them. What kind of conservative are you? I consider myself a neoconservative, uh, someone who's a little bit uh, you know, less concerned with uh, the size of government but also thinks that uh, there's a role for government to play. An advocate of limited government, though, however. You know, you don't want an over, uh, overweening government. And also someone who believes in uh, championing democracy throughout the world. And your position on the war in Iraq? I'm a supporter of the war in Iraq. Why? Well, I felt that at the time, obviously, the threat uh, that Saddam Hussein posed to the region and to the United States was real. And uh, since we find ourselves uh, doing our best to support a very fragile government there against uh, radicals, on both the Sunni extremist side and the Shia radical side, and then, of course, Al-Qaeda is in Iraq as well. 
So I, I think we need to continue to prosecute the war. There's certainly do much more to uh, achieve victory there, which is not the case now. This, uh, the story in this book was covered extensively in, in the newspapers. How, how much original reporting did you do for this book? I did uh, interviews with conservative movement officials. Um, a lot of this book uh, involved research more into the story itself, of course, talking with the investigators in the Senate Indian Affairs Committee, who were also investigating this story as, um, as I was writing it. But of course, uh, it does rely heavily on the Pulitzer Prize winning rep reportage of uh, Susan Schmidt and James Grimaldi of the Washington Post, who did just stunning work on the story. And what, was there a time when writing this book that you said, uh, I can't believe they did that? <laughs> I think the one moment where that really came to me, that kind of realization is this is just an amazing story, it concerns the uh, Tigua tribe of El Paso here in Texas. And this was a tribe that Abramoff and his gang basically uh, helped to close down their casino. But then, without the tribe's knowledge, they then went to the, casino, the, the tribe and said, well, we'll help you reopen it. And so there's this kind of this stunning uh, hubris and greed uh, that you find that characterizes so many of Abramoff's exploits. Were you able to interview any of the major players? Of no, I wasn't. Um, did you try? I did speak uh, to Ralph Reed, um, but, uh, and uh, Grover Norquist briefly, but um, not Abramoff nor Scanlon. Uh, do Ralph Reed and Grover Norquist have a future in the Republican Party hierarchy? I believe they do. I believe Ralph Reed's uh, career has been damaged by the Sabermoth scandal. I don't believe he's down and out. He was recently in Washington, for example, uh, celebrating the 10th anniversary of uh, the National Review Online. And Grover Norquist, of course, uh, though I believe embarrassed by the scandal, continues to have power in Washington. The question is, who is the next generation of conservative leaders? Who will come to power? And whether they will rely on Reed and, and Norquist as certain elements in the Bush administration and the House leadership have. That, uh, that's an open question, and it may not be uh, to their liking. It's a couple examples of people it might be? Who are what's the well, next if you look at a, if you look at an outside group, say uh, if you have uh, someone like Mitt Romney, say become president of the United States, he's from outside Washington. He's he's not necessarily going to look inside the Washington conservative movement community for leadership. And of course, John McCain too, who has uh, very public grievances with uh, Norquist and Reed. If he were to ascend in the Republican Party ranks, I believe there they would wane. Their power would wane. And who's going to make that decision of who's going to rise? Well, it's, uh, it's the voters, and that's what's right, so great about American democracy. Is ultimately, <laughs> we do get the government that represents us, uh, for better or for worse. So uh, conservative activists, of course, in those primary states. But We're seeing a heavy influx of independent spending uh, from political party groups right. uh, in this election. Will that influence continue in future elections? Oh, certainly. Uh, I don't think money is leaving politics anytime soon. Um, and, of course, the great thing about the rules, or perhaps the upsetting thing about the rules if you're a reformer, is that there are always ways around them. It's certainly in politics. And we find that every time people try to address the issue of money in politics, and they construct this elaborate campaign finance machinery, uh, people find ways to circumvent it. You know, there's a quote from Ralph Reed in the book uh, that says, he said once that money is like water, it's going to find a way to go around the trees. And that's certainly the case. Every new time we try to ban soft money, for example, we then have these 527 groups to sprout of, out of nowhere. So I think rather than to try to prevent money in politics, we may need to just expand the arena and have more room for it. Recognize that money is going to play a role, but then focus more on issues and debate and such. Where are you from originally? I'm from Northern Virginia, from Burke, Virginia, uh, right outside Washington, D.C. And which politicians influenced you as you were growing up? Well, there's no question Newt Gingrich did as I was growing up. And uh, Newt Gingrich